So yoga practice is really ultimately a way for us to take our attention inward. And so there's different styles of yoga, or I actually prefer to use the term schools of yoga. In the tradition, there's different schools. And the school that I kind of have studied under mostly is Tantra Hatha Yoga. So I've studied a lot of the Tantric tradition. And in that tradition is Hatha Yoga. And Hatha Yoga is the study of how we can use our bodies to transform consciousness, to transform our mind. And so we do different things with our body to start affecting the qualities of mind um, and our energy, um, our life force energy. So there's different, you know, there's different practices. And, and I would just kind of like put a little caveat on that and say like a lot of what's being demonstrated on Instagram, you know, Instagram yogis is not really yoga. Um, and I could kind of like go into that a lot more, but that's it. I would just say like, that's not really yoga. It's, it's really more about, um, how should I say, like really in diving into a practice and being really committed to it and following, um, certain, um, practices under the advice of a teacher or under the guidance of a teacher. All right. Thanks for joining us at the Life of a Career podcast, Aaron. Uh, Before we get started, can you give us a quick introduction of who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Yogi Aaron. I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada, Um, and I moved to New York to teach yoga for about 10 years. And there I got the inspiration after opening up a yoga studio there to then open up a yoga retreat center in Costa Rica. And I offer yoga teacher trainings there. Um, And yeah, that's it in a very short nutshell. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's super interesting. I can't wait to dive into that, that actual full story, but sort of at this moment, what, like, what do you do at this yoga center? Like, what do you teach? Who are your clients? So I, I, specifically personally offer yoga teacher training immersions which um, are both 14 day and 28 day immersions and so usually our groups or or the group of people that come is 15 to 25 people and we kind of dive into um, obviously how to teach yoga so I'm teaching them how to become yoga teachers and but it's really more of an opportunity for people to really dive into an experience of what living yoga really means. Like a lot of people call themselves yogis or endeavor to live a yoga lifestyle. It's another thing to actually step into that world and have an immersive experience of, you know, waking up with the sun Um, and quite organically, by the way, it's not as painful as it sounds. And, (laughs) and, and really kind of like living a healthy lifestyle for a couple of weeks, waking up with the sun, um, practicing morning silence, eating good, nutritious food, and, and then practicing yoga and meditation um, throughout the day and discussing, you know, really how do we become better human beings? That's really what it's all about. I think that these yoga immersions should be sometimes called life immersions. How do we become better people in life? Um, And then we also at Blue Osa offer like individual um, retreat packages. So we have a lot of school teachers coming. We have a lot of, ironically, actually, um, anesio, and probably don't say this right, anesiologists, um, you know, because they have such high stress jobs. We had a whole bunch of them starting to come through. Um, but we have a lot of people coming in that are looking to take a respite from their life. And then probably another big group of, of clients that we get are yoga teachers that are bringing their yoga groups to come and, and lead their own sort of yoga immersion for a week. So that's kind of, that. those are the different kinds of people. 
I don't have a lot to do with the day-to-day things. I've, after 14 years um, of building it up, I now have the luxury to kind of like step away from it a little bit and kind of like focus on other areas of my life that I want to thrive in a little bit more. Yeah, that's great. Um, what type of yoga or can you define what yoga is? And then is there different categories of yoga? Can you kind of go into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So yoga, it depends on who you ask and what they say. You ask a lot of people and they'll give you different responses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote scripture or give scriptural reference. And in the, what yoga is according to the yoga sutras is practices that lead you to a state of mind where your thoughts are moving inward peacefully, like your attention is moving inward. And when that happens, we're at complete peace within ourselves. And from that place, our life purpose can unfold. And we know ourselves at every level. And what I just said sounds really easy, but of course it's not. (laughs) So like Patanjali summarized that up in the first three sutras and then spends the next 193 sutras to tell us how to get back to that state because we keep messing it up. So yoga practice is really ultimately a way for us to take our attention inward. And so there's different styles of yoga, or I actually prefer to use the term schools of yoga. In the tradition, there's different schools. And the school that I kind of have studied under mostly is Tantra Hatha Yoga. So I've studied a lot of the tantric tradition. And in that tradition is Hatha Yoga. And Hatha Yoga is the study of how we can use our bodies to transform consciousness, to transform our mind. And so we do different things with our body to start affecting the qualities of mind um, and our energy, um, our life force energy. So there's different, you know, there's different practices. and, And I would just kind of like put a little caveat on that and say like a lot of what's being demonstrated on Instagram, you know, Instagram yogis is not really yoga. Um, And I could kind of like go into that a lot more, but that's it. I would just say like, that's not really yoga. It's, it's really more about um, how should I say, like really in diving into a practice and being really committed to it and following, um, certain um, practices under the advice of a teacher or under the guidance of a teacher. And could you kind of just, I know you didn't want to go too deep into the, the Instagram (laughs) yoga type of uh, or whatever they practice, but could you sort of showcase what the differentiation is between more of a formalized yoga with different schools of practices versus what we probably see in the mainstream and in terms of like hot yoga and all this other stuff that we generally see. Yeah. I mean, I should just quantify what I was meaning by Instagram yogi is, is that you see a lot of like crazy party tricks. That's really what I'm referring to as sort of these party tricks of people doing one hand handstands or, you know, kind of like twirling on their head or hanging from silks, you know, from the ceiling. I mean, there's all kinds of things. And people are kind of trying to put that into this sort of yoga category. Um, And what in the tradition, um, there are different schools of yoga. And so one of them is Hatha yoga. And in Hatha yoga, as I mentioned, we, we use the body as a way to transform consciousness. And so traditionally, when you do postures, you usually hold postures for a long period of time. And it doesn't have to be a complicated posture, but when we start to hold the body in a certain way for a long period of time and breathe in a certain way and hold our attention in a certain way and bring our mind to a certain point in our body, and we do that, for an extended period of time. And when I say extended, I'm talking 
like, you know, three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes. Um, and, and it could be even longer uh, that there's something that starts to happen with our mind. Our mind starts to shift its momentum. And, you know, a lot of people run into problems in life because their mind is flowing in a certain way. You know, people, you know, that keep, for example, bumping into themselves in life, you know, they keep falling down, they keep running into problems, they keep, rehearsing the same story over and over and over. And then they wonder why nothing ever changes. It's because something in their mind isn't changing. And so what yoga does in a very powerful and potent way is we start to shift that momentum and we're all stuck, you know, kind of like in this current of life, you know, we're stuck in our own, another word for it is habit patterns. We're stuck in our habit patterns. And the goal then is to shift and I'm not talking about now the outward habit patterns. I'm talking about the habit patterns within our mind. And so if we can start to shift that or at least put those habit patterns on a stop, like we can stop them for just a moment. There's something remarkable that starts to happen. People either two, one of two things happens, like people just kind of wake up and go, oh my God, I was doing that. I no longer want to do that. Or they just keep practicing yoga long enough that those habit patterns just stop. They just stop on a dime. And you see that, you see evidence of, of that happen a lot. People go to take yoga classes and all of a sudden they make these big life changes where, you know, they, they stop, they quit their job, they find a healthy relationship, they quit smoking, they change their diet. Um, they do all kinds of things. Maybe they go start traveling and they, they want to go volunteer somewhere. So a lot of people just kind of make these kind of spontaneous uh, changes. And in the yoga tradition, we actually call that like there was like this kind of like awakening, if you will. Like that's one word I could use other words, but there's this inner awakening. Um, and that's what happens when we start to shift that momentum. We start to breathe in a different way. And the light of consciousness just wakes up within us. And that's the, that for me is like the big charge of why I, the charge I get from teaching yoga and what kind of motivates me as a teacher. What are the qualifications to become a yoga instructor? Since you teach it, I'm, I'm very curious. Like, is there any formalized certification? Is it through lineages, almost like martial arts, where it's like you can pinpoint this was the person who taught you and then someone else taught you. How, how is it, how is that, I guess, certification uh, performed or is there legal certifications? Is like the state uh, have some sort of certification process for these? Um, that's a very good question. The certification is actually very easy uh, to become a yoga teacher. You can go to any yoga teacher training, which is usually 200 hours um, and 200 hours is all you need to start teaching people yoga. So I offer a 200 hour and I offer it in two different formats. One is 14 days. One is 28 days. You can go find a yoga studio. A lot of yoga studios teach or offer teacher trainings that sometimes take nine months. You know, it's like, um, two weekends a month, you know, for nine months or something like that. <coughs> but um, I, I can't speak to a lot of other yoga teacher trainings. You asked about lineage. I always tell people I teach an authentic Himalayan, uh, tradition. I teach as, as authentically as I can to the tradition. Um, there's a lot of things in my yoga teacher training that are like directly related to the tradition. Um, and so as much as I can, I bring a, as an authentic, as much as I can, an authentic experience to the practice so that not only am I passing on something that's real, but I'm also honoring the lineage that came before me. Um, so sometimes some teachers say that they teach from a lineage, but I don't know that they are. Um, and a lot of lineages, quote unquote, have kind of cropped up 
in the last, you know, 20 years. So, <laughs> but I always say, I, <clears throat> what I teach is, you know, like, for example, there's some mantras that I teach and I always, before I teach them, I always kind of open it and remind people, like people have been chanting these mantras for more than 5,000 years. I mean, kind of like wrap your head around that for a moment, you know, Judaism isn't even as old as 5,000 years. And, you know, all the great, there's not one great religion that's older than 5,000 years old, really. Um, so that's kind of like a big deal, I think, if you kind of like step back and go, wow, the moment I speak these words, I'm, I'm connected to this long line of people. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yoga practices are are definitely the most ancient in the world that we can we can keep track of <laughs> yeah. but a lot of people do yoga teacher trainings you know to not necessarily become teachers um they do it i mean that sometimes they don't want to be teachers and they do a teacher training that's like oh i want to start teaching yoga now and then other people um want to be teachers <clears throat> do yoga teacher training and, and then decide that they don't want to do it but either way a lot of people do a yoga teacher training just to really kind of like take a bigger bite out of the apple. You know, when you go to a 45 minute class or an, even a 75 minute class, you don't really get a taste of the tradition and doing a yoga teacher training opens up that possibility. Okay. Is you said 200 hours, is there an organization that sort of codified that 200 hours or how, how can yeah. yeah, sure. Um, people, <clears throat> people can, yeah, there is an organization that does kind of, is the licensing, if you will. I mean, licensing is a big word. It's probably better to say certifies um, and, and kind of governs it in, in a very, small way, but big way is Yoga Alliance. So that's one of the big ones. Um, I think that there's a California Yoga Alliance and I've heard that there's a Colorado Yoga Alliance. So a lot, there's different ones, but the one, <coughs> the big one is uh, Yoga Alliance. And it's kind Got of it. recognized around the world now. So a lot, that's where a lot of schools are connected to like mine. Okay. That makes sense. What's a day-to-day -day like in running a yoga center uh, and also teaching? I know you used to teach a lot, but now I think you're more um, on the management side, but what's a day-to-day -day sort of like? <laughs> I did teach a lot and um, I've been starting to teach a lot more again, in, I, interestingly, recently, but you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I've kind of stepped back a little bit from the day to days, but I've spent for the better part of 14 years, you know, building it up. And, um, a lot of running blue Osa, uh, yoga retreat has, it's been kind of an interesting journey. Um, when I first started <clears throat> leading yoga teacher trainings in, in yoga retreats, a yoga retreat was something that was very revered that people came to, I think with sincere intentions of really trying to find themselves. And, and I would say that that's still true, but also people come with more of a, of a holiday or a vacation kind of attitude. And so it's not so much of a yoga retreat where it becomes more of a yoga vacation so when I opened up Blue Osa, I never knew that I'd be opening up a yoga hotel in many ways. And so that's, that was probably one of the biggest learning curves in the sort of day-to-day -day kind of like operations or life um, that I had to kind of like confront and deal with. Um, but, you know, one of the beautiful things about being at Blue Osa and, and of course, you know, we're in Costa Rica, which is very close to the equator, is that we have very balanced days and nights. And so the sun usually wakes up, you know, around five o'clock, 5.15, 5.30 in the morning. 
and <clears throat> and then and then goes to bed, you know, six six thirty, and so we really get into that kind of circadian rhythms of of you know the day to day sort of life here, which is really cool. And uh, so usually get up in the morning and we practice morning silence. So that means that guests can't come and complain to you because we're practicing silence. <laughs> but one of the things that we really do is encourage people to watch the sunrise. And we, we have coffee ready very early in the morning, coffee and tea. Um, and so it gives me an opportunity as an owner to just have my own space, to meditate, to practice yoga, to take my dogs for the walks in the mornings. And then I usually hit the office and do the administrative kind of day-to-day -day things. And my team is around 25 people. So there's always a lot of people to kind of like manage there. And, um, and then we have lunch. And sometimes the afternoons are a mixture of exercise or more work or more beach walks. Uh, and then usually at dinner time, right around 5.30, we don't have dinner at 5.30, but usually at 5.30 is when I stop and uh, end the day with a beautiful glass of wine as the sun sets. Okay. Yeah. That's, I, I just thought of this question because yours is a very unique case in terms of you building a business in Costa Rica. How hard was it to being from Canada, I think you're, you're, you're probably still Canadian, right? Um, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Don't so give up that Canadian passport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's it like to build a business in Costa Rica or how difficult was it? Well, I think it's important, it, you know, for any kind of entrepreneurs listening, it's really important to understand it's, it's difficult to build a, a business anywhere. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, you're going to run into problems. I mean, you know, I shouldn't say problems. A better word is challenges. You're always going to face challenges. And um, I think, you know, before when I had my studio in New York and before I opened my studio, I kept things very simple. You know, it was very, very, very simple. I had very little, quote unquote, overhead. Um, most of my overhead was sort of electronic, so I really didn't have much overhead. And, and so opening up a, you know, a brick and mortar business, you're automatically tied into um, uh, day to day costs that you then become responsible for. And so for, that's the first thing, like that's the biggest first challenge that I had to adjust to. And you know, before the pandemic, um, well, let's just say when I say before, I mean, you know, it was like March 12, 2020, you know, leading up to that point, our overhead was $80,000 a month. And, you know, imagine being responsible for that. In, in hindsight, you know, one of the beautiful things about the pandemic, <laughs> there was many beautiful things, by the way, I, I kind of err on the side of positivity, but but there was many positive things. One of the biggest takeaways was it really gave us a chance to kind of like look at our costs and kind of start making cutbacks and deciding where we really needed to spend money and where we didn't. So that kind of for me was the biggest challenge. But aside from that, you know, there's like opening up a, a, a business uh, on the beach in Costa Rica, you're dealing with a whole other culture. And, and then you're working with, you have employees working with you that look at life through a very different lens. And that took a lot of adjustment. And if I'm being honest, it's still, you know, 14 years later, still adjusting. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I think like kind of <clears throat> moving to a different country is an, easy and, and anybody who's moved, you know, like to the U S that's listening to this or, or immigrated to a different country knows it's not easy because you all of a sudden have to be in a different culture and learn how to relate to people in a different way. And I think that has been one of the hardest kind of like adjustments um, because not everybody here views, you know, business and, 
and kind of uh, money or success in the same way that I do. And, um, and, and sort of like being responsible for, um, you know, property and, and business. So I think those are some of the biggest challenges that I've had to face. What about getting uh, and attracting clients? I assume that most of them are from out of Costa Rica, right? To, to come to a, a retreat. Um, how difficult is it to attract people from all over the world, I assume, to come in and, and uh, you know, take part in, in your programs? Well, I mean, when we opened up Blue Osa, I saw a huge opportunity to have foreigners come to us. You know, <clears throat> we, we only need somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 to 800 people a year to thrive. You know, it, that's not a lot of people when you really think about it. And, um, so I, you know, I kind of knew that if we could get that many people, we would do really well as a business. And so there was, that was one thought. Another thought was sort of this yoga retreat idea was just starting to really grow. And, you know, you saw other yoga retreat centers starting to crop up and, and more and more yoga teachers were wanting to bring their yoga students to you know, foreign locations. And so that's kind of like what prompted um, that idea. And so I would say it hasn't been that difficult. Um, there really aren't a lot of yoga retreat centers in the United States. So for people to really, you know, experience a yoga retreat, they need to go somewhere. And, you know, there's a lot of different places. People go to Bali, people go to Mexico. Um, I think there's one in a couple in Guatemala. So th there's all kinds of all over the place. And um, it, it wasn't really that much of a stretch. Uh, however, having said that, you know, getting to blows, it does require Americans specifically to take more than one flight. And I would say that that is the hardest thing because a lot of Americans hate taking more than one flight to get to anywhere. So we have to do a really good job in selling, you know, people on that idea. <laughs> Interesting. The, what made you land in Costa Rica then? If, you know, for going from New York, did, did you have some family ties? Have you, had you been to Costa Rica? What, what, what triggered the, the idea to start in Costa Rica? Being from Canada. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, I was in New York and I had my yoga studio there and I started leading yoga retreats. Um, to date, I've led more than 100 yoga retreats around the world since like 2003. So I, I was kind of experienced in one of the places I went to was Blue or to Costa Rica. And the place that where Blue Osa is right now, I was actually leading yoga retreats just down the road from us. And so on the third, it was the third trip. And I remember driving down the road and there was a Century 21 sign outside this property. And as I drove by where the gate was, the gate wasn't very high. It was a low, low gate. And I could see past the gate through this tunnel of bougainvilleas and hibiscus flowers. And at the end of it was this turquoise ocean. And I just, my heart just said home. And so that's kind of like how I found that place. Um, you know, I went back there a few days later, uh, went and checked it out and I just fell in love with it. And I just saw like this opportunity for, you know, there to be a beautiful yoga retreat there. It's one of the very few, if not only, uh, properties in Costa Rica that's right on the beach, that's a hotel or a yoga retreat. And it's l like literally right on the beach. And it's just amazing. So that's kind of like how I ended up there. I, the other answer is like, I was, I fell in love with Hawaii. I mean, who doesn't fall in love with Hawaii? And Costa Rica on so many levels is very similar to Hawaii. 
Um, you know, Hawaii has that sort of aloha spirit. Costa Rica has this Pura Vida spirit, which is very similar to the same idea of aloha. It's both, they're both like almost on the equator. Um, they're both, you know, tropical climates. They're both really green. Um, it's just really very, very, very similar. And that's, so when I came to Costa Rica, I thought this is a great alternative to moving to Hawaii. I just always felt like Hawaii was so far away from everything, which it is. And Costa Rica is like a quick, you know, I can get on a plane and be in Miami in two hours. So it's really not that far uh, as people might think it is from a lot of different places. Yeah. I, I've been to uh, Costa Rica and it definitely was a lot shorter of a flight than I thought it would, yeah. <laughs> it would be going into <laughs> Central America. Um, yeah. Okay. That's super interesting. So I guess you ha already had a level of confidence that you did have, you know, clientele that were traveling with you basically. Yes. And that you could, you could kind of draw from that pool of, uh, clientele or consumer base and, and pull them in to your specific uh, retreat, right? Yeah. I mean, I would say that there was a certain confidence more than anything that if I could do this, then I just had to find other yoga teachers to do it. So it did take us, you know, a good three, four years to really um, get the engine moving but as we started, you know, growing, more and more people found out about us, especially yoga teachers who were like, oh, my God, I really want to bring my group of students to you guys. Um, and so now we get, you know, many emails a day from from different group leaders. Uh, but, yeah, definitely leading leading yoga retreats and bringing people to Costa Rica firsthand gave me that sort of uh, confidence to take that leap. Did you have to do any, and actually do you still do any big marketing or is it most of it just word of mouth now? Oh no, we're constantly marketing. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we're pushing many marketing different, many different marketing projects. Um, and I would just say like, it's really important to make sure you always have a strong marketing arm. Um, I'm always reminded that Nike, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's still, you know, have a strong marketing arm. And it's really important to always keep doing that. Um, and, you know, I always, my friend, my, I have friends that have different resorts and they're very, they're geniuses when it comes to marketing, but they're always like, I'm not happy about what's happening in the next year. I'm always, I, I'm always thinking about what's happening three years or four years down the road. That's where my marketing mind goes. So I'm always like planting the seeds and, and it's interesting because we do, you know, obviously we do stuff with social media and we do different email campaigns and, and different things that people can uh, take part of. Like one of them, we just spent a lot of time talking about yoga teacher training. We have a whole, you know, is yoga teacher training right for me series. And it kind of like takes people on this journey for a couple of weeks. And if they stay in, it's, it ends up being like a year. And, but we have people that contact us and say, oh, I've been following you guys for six years. I finally have an opportunity to come. I'm so excited. And that just makes me so happy. And that's just a testament to so many things. But one of them is like how important good marketing is and, and continuing with it and keeping it up. Yeah, that's great. It's it's really cool to see that you have that extended community that you might not even be inter interacting with actively and, yes. and they're out there and you could have six years to pull someone into your, your resort. That's, that's, that's really cool. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that level of timeline when it comes to marketing that you're doing something that might take six years before someone commits, which makes sense. Um, yeah. Fat. Yeah. Um, it's my so, boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's great to hear that this is the level of marketing that's required for, you know, a very successful business such as yours. Yeah. Um, but you also want to try and figure out how to 
you know, make it automated as well. So like I was just talking about this, is yoga teacher training right for me? Like we built it out. Now people just plug into it and it's all automated. So we don't have to do anything anymore. Maybe once in a while go in and tweak things here and there, but we don't really have to do anything with it. Um, People just, you know, get plugged in on their own time, so to speak. And I think that that's really important is, is part of your marketing has to go, why am I doing this? What is the importance of it? And, you know, I really used to stress out about Facebook and Instagram. And then one day I realized, well, it wasn't one day, it was over a period of time, but I was realizing like, I don't need to put so much energy into this. It should be easy. It should be fun. It, you know, it's not about trying to get customers there. It's about building relationships and showing people who we are. And so it doesn't need to be that complicated. And so I think it's really important that people keep that in mind. Um, Of course, it's a lot more layered than that. It's a lot more nuanced than that. But um, it's you want to make it really easy and obviously as cheap as possible, too. So that's also really important. Being a a resort uh, of sorts, <laughs> you, you've said it's like a hotel almost, a yoga hotel. <laughs> do, do you do you see um, other people who attend your students or clients uh, doing marketing that have really helped as well? Because I've seen that for certain other like ayahuasca retreats, you know, the, where they let the students film the entire you know, process, almost like a documentary. And I think that the, those are pretty effective in attracting more people into uh, the resorts. Do you see that happening with your uh, business as well? Yeah. I mean, one of the geniuses, I think of a place like us, you know, where a normal hotel, they're just looking for guests, right. To come and where we're with us because we bring so many groups they will then, in all of their marketing, share our website and tell our student, tell their students, come to us. And then in turn, of course, we list their yoga retreat. And so we're linking to them as well. So it's this beautiful synergistic exchange of, of you know, marketing energy, for lack of better words. And of course, we're promoting them, you know, through our social media channels and that sort of thing. And they're promoting us. So it's this is where we really differ from a regular hotel because we do have this kind of exchange of energy, if you will, um, with our yoga teachers. Going back to the, um, Costa Rica, building a business in Costa Rica. I just thought of this again. Um, is it challenging from a, like a legal standpoint to create a business there, uh, as a foreigner? Um, I would say for the most part, no, it's really rather easy. In fact, since the pandemic um, happened in Costa Rica, Open Up actually was one of the very first countries to open up and welcome people. They have a very active, um, you know, tourism here. And, you know, I would just say for the most part, um, Costa Rica makes it really easy for either people to A, come and live here and B, if they want to open up a business. Um, Obviously you do need some, you know, guidance. It's not just, you know, black and white, Um, but it is relatively easy to come and make a life here and, and open up a business. Okay. Um, I kind of want to turn the conversation a little bit more towards your personal story. Um, I'm very curious about how you you got into yoga in the first place. Is this something that you always wanted to do ever since you were young? Uh, I no, I no, 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 no. Um, I by the time I was 18, the short story is that I I was a very active, you know, teenager. I went to an all boys boarding school. I dog sled. I snowshoed. I canoed. Um, I trail ran, uh, cross country ran. I, I, I was very active, ice hockey. Um, and by the time I turned 18, I started to notice that my body was 
stiffening up. And I really kind of felt like that if I really wanted to stay young, that I needed to stay mobile. And so yoga seemed to be the right way. Like I got into yoga because of the quote unquote stretching. And so whenever I refer to yoga back then, it's really was more about stretching and trying to, you know, loosen up my hamstrings and yeah. And, and what I started teaching really by fluke, like it was never even on my radar to teach. I used to be a scuba instructor. So that was actually what I really thought I would become was a scuba instructor. And I really got into underwater photography and I really thought like, Oh, this is going to be my life. And, um, and then I just got into teaching yoga and it was, it, what happened was I started teaching and then I went down to Los Angeles to take classes with a teacher there named Brian Kest. And Brian Kest um, is still teaching yoga today, by the way. He's an amazing teacher. And he, I saw him walking around the class and he had this group of like 150 people in the room. And he was walking around and he really wasn't teaching yoga postures. He was giving a monologue on how to start incorporating yoga into your life in in a very kind of direct and real way. And it, my mind sort of went, I can do this. I feel like I've been training my whole life to be this person at this moment, you know, And so that was the moment I decided to become a teacher and like a real teacher, like not just teaching it on the side, but like, I really want to make my life about this. So I did. And, um, I got, kept getting into teaching. And then of course, you know, I, I, my path led me to New York and then I opened up my studio. But one of the things that I kept dealing with on my journey was pain. I kept hurting myself over and over and over. And and it was really kind of weird to me because, you know, I was busy, I was doing all of these great postures and I should never have been in that much pain, but I was. And sometimes I would kind of fix it, but it would always come back with more of a vengeance. And it just kept escalating from there. And, and, And then I kind of like got to a point, it was about 25 years into my yoga journey that I ended up in an orthopedic surgeon's office who told me I might need a spinal fusion. And you can kind of imagine like what that's like for someone who teaches yoga to go, I've been teaching people these poses that now I'm in the surgeon's office being told I might need a spinal fusion. And so that really kind of gave me pause and kind of to go back to school and study anatomy and study the body and study muscle function. And that led me into learning more about muscle activation technique um, and understanding what happens when we stretch and what happens and what we really should be doing instead of stretching. Um, And then that's kind of led me into this kind of a Yama approach, if you will, Um, applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation, which I'm really passionate about to kind of show people how to start improving their muscle function in their body so they can start to live a more pain-free life. Oh, interesting. What type of classes were you taking? Like, you know, is, is it formalized classes in colleges or something like that? Or what programs did you end up And how did you go and find those programs, I guess? Well, I mean, first of all, um, I, like I said, I'm from Vancouver. And Vancouver is home, as my mother always lovingly says, who's also from Vancouver, um, that Vancouver is home to the nuts, fruits, and flights of the world. So, (laughs) So, you know, back then, this was back in like, you know, the late 80s. <clears throat> early nineties. And so there's like yoga wasn't really a big thing, but there was like definitely places that had or yoga centers, you know, yoga places. But quite frankly, I actually got into yoga by taking, you know, 
I had a VHS machine um, plugged in. One of my teachers, actually, I still call him my teacher today, Eric Shipman. And then I discovered Brian Kest. And um, and then a friend of mine, a few, uh, started teaching yoga. And so I would take his classes. So that's kind of like how I really got into it. How did you get the... Um, I oh. I feel like starting a business in New York is very daunting. How did you get that type of audacity, I guess, or courage to to go to New York and say, I'm going to start a yoga studio because I'm sure that there were a lot of competitors. Uh, I'm sure I, it's New York, right? So I, I, I figured there'd be a lot of yoga. Um, yeah, absolutely. So... I, I mean, when I went to New York, I really didn't have the intention of opening up a yoga studio. Um, I really had the intention of just teaching privately. So when I, you know, I, I said earlier, like I kept my expenses really low. That's because I would always teach either from my own home or go to people's homes and, and teach. And I got to a point where actually I had a beautiful place in Manhattan simple place was actually up in Harlem and I created a little, you know, very small, like two person, uh, studio for me to teach people privates in my, in my home. And so my expenses were really low, but I was also teaching classes. And so I would just actually rent space. I would rent space. There was actually at one point, like four different spaces I was renting and so Thursday night was at one place, Sunday was another place, Tuesday was another place, Wednesday was another. It was like the traveling yoga show. And finally, I just made the decision to find a studio and find a place that I could actually just um, call home. And that was actually the moment that things really changed because that when I did that, the kind of clientele, I guess, that I was attracting really gave us a sense of home and a sense of community, which engendered that community. And that was from that experience that I, I, you know, opened up Blue Osa. But how did I do it? I don't know. I, I'm a very smart business person um, in combination with, I think it was a lot younger then. So I didn't care about certain things that I might have cared about now. Like, you know, I'm not too worried about, you know, the bathroom fixtures uh, or, you know, what kind of wallpaper is on the wall. I keep things very simple and, but also like nice and clean and, and looks great. Um, so that's kind of like my modality or my, my philosophy. I think the, the term I like is sexy, simple, chic, you know, and, and just keep it like low cost, but keep it clean and simple, but also stylish. And so when I opened up my studio, it kind of like had those qualities and it was a really cool space. It was actually kind of like this loft space in, you know, like these old sort of warehouse buildings in New York. It was on the corner of 26th Street and 10th Avenue. And it was turning into an art gallery district at that time. So you know, I managed to find a place that was affordable and I could make it work. What um, recommendations would you have for someone who is interested in becoming a yoga instructor or and maybe starting their own business in teaching yoga? Sure. I thought you were going to say opening up a yoga studio. I was like, don't do it. Don't open up a yoga studio. Rent spaces. It's a lot easier. Um, what advice? I mean, I would just say start doing the practice. You know, if you're meant to be a teacher, the you will become inspired from doing your practice, you know. Um, but start studying. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see perpetuated in the yoga world, especially, I think that we could say this all across the board, but I'll stick in my lane for now. Um, in, you know, in the yoga world is that yoga teachers get their certificate and then that's it. 
they think they're completely qualified. And a yoga certificate, a 200-hour yoga certificate, at the end of the day, if we really want to distill it, what that certificate means, it means you're teaching people how to move safely and you're teaching people how to breathe. That's it. You know, you're not, there's nothing else. And a lot of yoga teachers that have that very basic teaching start to teach people things that they have no business teaching. Um, And so I think it's really so important to really as a yoga teacher and, and really as just as a human being to keep trying to advance yourself, keep trying to learn more. Um, And we stop growing as a person the moment we stop learning. Um, And I, I can't emphasize that enough. Like, you know, when I opened Blue Ocean and came to Costa Rica, one of the things that really hurt me was that I didn't have access to my teachers. You know, I, my teachers were in New York, they were in the United States. So I was really isolated. And when I made the decision to start studying muscle activation technique, yeah, I, w- I had hurt my back a lot and, and needed to try and understand the body. But, but I also really did it because I really was craving to learn and I knew that I was becoming stagnant as a human being. I was becoming stagnant as a teacher because I wasn't really being inspired, you know. And, and so doing that practice, doing that course gave me a whole different way to approach life, changed my perspective. And we need that. We need that as humans. Um, so I would really encourage people to come back to your question, like, how do you know or what steps would you take? I would just say, keep learning. And <clears throat> if you're inspired, that will grow automatically, you know. Um, and, it, and if it's not in yoga, then you'll be in yoga will take you to where you need to be inspired to start your journey. That's great. Um, before we close this out, is there any other uh, advice that you might want to impart to our listeners, whether it's on a career perspective or maybe just life in general? I would, I would really encourage people to really take time. And and we kind of hear this a little bit in different quarters, you know, people say like, spend time on your mission statement, spend time on your vision statement. And whether or not you do those things or not, what is important is to wake up every day and ask yourself if you're really fulfilling the purpose of your life and are you, is what you're doing fulfilling you? And if it's not change, change careers, change paths. Um, or ask yourself like, how can I be in purpose here? When I opened blue house, I never used to offer really programs and, I kind of had a crisis of conscience around 2015. Uh, it was about five years after I'd opened up Blue Osa. And I kind of had that crisis of conscience. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, you know, my life is not about opening up a, you know, making sure the toilets are working properly in a yoga resort, you know. And And I realized that I was not teaching and that was sort of the missing link is like, I really need to be teaching. I need to be putting myself out there. And so I didn't, I didn't give up Blue Osa. I just wove my purpose more fully into it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to give up your career or give up your life or, you know, whatever. You just, sometimes you can find ways to bring that sense of purpose into what you're doing. And that's so important because every day that we don't live in our purpose is a day that we're, you know, we've lost. And um, so I would encourage people to wake up every day and look in the mirror and say, am I living my life purpose? Am I living a fulfilled life? And if it isn't do something that day to start flipping the script. I think that's amazing advice. How can they find you uh, or contact you if they're interested in learning more about what you do? Um, They can go to my website, yogiaron.com. If you'd be so kind to put it in the show notes too, but it's Yogi Aaron with two A's. Um, And 
right there, they have access to a lot of free content. Um, I've created like, you know, one of my crowning achievements during the pandemic, I created this um, affirmation series and it's a 28 day affirmation series to manifest and live your life purpose. So I was just talking about purpose a lot. And that's something I'm very passionate about because I really love to see people step more into their purpose. And I think that's how we start changing the world to become a better place for all of us is that if we start to thrive more individually as human beings, then, you know, we thrive together as, as a whole. And uh, I, so that's a free series that people can, can get. I've also got a pain-free series. So there's everything that I've been talking about, they can have access uh, to it through my website. Great. And yeah, we'll definitely put the link in our show notes so that our listeners can easily access it. Um, really appreciate everything that you shared, uh, Yogi Aaron. It was great. I, <laughs> I took a lot from it myself and uh, thinking about potentially going down to Costa Rica. <laughs> so um, I, I hope yeah. sooner than later, Eric. Yeah. So thank you so much for imparting all of your advice and, and, you know, even business advice. I, I didn't think too much about our conversation and I'm actually surprised. I pleasantly surprised that, Oh yeah, we actually did have a business conversation as well. So that's great. Awesome. Uh, so awesome. yeah. All Thank right. you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. If you like this video and would like to see more career education content, please click like, and subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Thanks for supporting our mission.